This video is sponsored by Manta Comics, the global webcomic service with over 4 million cumulative downloads and an average of 10 new series debuts each month. One of the series I've been reading is Fry My Life, a comic about a disgraced food blogger trying to find the secret behind an amazing fish and chip shop. Manta also boasts big hit romances like Under the Oak Tree, Semantic Error, Totem's Realm and I've been having a lot of fun bouncing around between series just scrolling through their incredible art. You can do the same by visiting the link in the description to download the Manta app for free on the iOS store or Google Play. And thanks again to Manta for sponsoring this video. <laughs> Back in high school Japanese class, we had a cool teacher, one who would occasionally let us put on anime at the end of class. Most of what I remember were Ghibli films, but there were also episodes of Code Geass, Fruits Basket, and most relevantly, Bakano. On first viewing, Bakano's debut is bizarre. I was overwhelmed with characters, scenes, and plot threads, but there was very little to grab onto. Instead, I found myself awash with its style. I'd never seen anime like this before. Even the opening was distinctive. Instead of introducing anything to do with the story or showing who the main characters are, it it's instead dedicated to introducing every member of the cast by name with stylish match cuts, inspired by the 2000 movie Snatch's opening credits. As soon as I got home, I started watching the rest of the show and absolutely loved it. Not long after, I jumped onto my anime list recommendation section and watched all the way through its spiritual successor, Durarara, as well. Today, these are two of my favourite anime, and since it was Bakano's 15th anniversary last month, there's been no better time to tell you why. I re-watched both of these shows this year and I found myself liking them even more. There's nothing quite like Bakano and Durarara. Nothing with their aptitude for non-linear storytelling, nothing with their sense of time and place, and nothing with casts this bizarrely lovable. For me, these shows are masterpieces, the heights of anime storytelling, grand creations from the combined teams of author Ryogo Narita, director Takahiro Omori, screenwriter Noboru Takagi, producer Yumi Sato, and a collection of brilliant animators and artists. This is a group of talented people that worked so well together that they stuck together. Through Bakano, through Dorora, and even when Yumi Sato decided to leave Brain Space to found her own studio Shuka, the gang followed for Dorora's second season. When I finally got around to reading the Bakano light novels, it was a surprise. You start reading volume 1 and there's no train, no Carol. No hunt for Dallas Genoard. That confusing first episode of the anime was actually a direct message to Ryogo Narita fans, the readers of these books. It jumbled things up, showed the endings before the starts, featured scenes from novels that would never be adapted. They even used characters from Volume 9, which released less than a year before the anime debuted, to deliver a message that basically said, sure, the books start in 1930, but instead of telling the story chronologically, why don't we dash forwards and backwards in time while focusing on the perspectives of each character? In that way, everyone's story becomes important, and so you don't really end up having any singular main character. You just have people that seem... main character-ish. This was the idea of director Takehiro Amari, and he pitched it to Takagi, the screenwriter, and eventually narrator himself. It's not unusual for a Wonka anime to adapt for light novel volumes, but it is unusual to do them all at once. 1930, 1931, 1932. In the anime, those are treated like dates, but in the light novels, the years are titles. Every time they put a year on screen, they're switching to a different story. It is confusing, especially when parts of the third story take place in late 31, but it's kind of meant to be confusing. Omori wanted Bakano to challenge the viewer to put the pieces together, and so each time you revisit a scene, you feel like you're understanding it more 
and more. Each character has some unexpected element to them. An innocent child who's actually a cynical immortal. A cowardly gangster who can become fearless at will. A pair of expert thieves who are somehow also lovingly dumb. When the project started, adapting Bakano was a scary proposition. The lack of a main character and the change of cast between volumes would make for an odd anime. They brought up three options. One, designate a main character who the audience will follow. The director turned that down. Two, change the story to something original. The author turned that down. So they went with three, mess with the structure and really capitalize on an ensemble cast. The whole staff were obsessed with the series Lost at the time and Amori had picked up some ideas from a film called 21 Grams. So there was more confidence in a fragmented main characterless series. <laughs> the anime's erratic storytelling took one year to plan, and it works because these characters are worth following. One of my favourite episodes is the 8th, titled Isaac and Miria unintentionally spread happiness around them, and what plays out is exactly that. At this point in the show, things aren't going well in any of the three stories, but episode 8 synchronizes them all up to show points in which Isaac and Miria's unique energy gives them strength. The episode director was Kiyotaka Ohata, a friend of the series director who was essentially appointed the production's Isaac and Miria expert. He has way more experience in comedy and slapstick than the rest of the team, and so he was specifically asked to direct and storyboard episodes that heavily featured Isaac and Miria. It wasn't just him of course, these two were favourites of the entire production team and they are there to tie the whole story together, appearing in each and every storyline and featuring in the final scenes of both the TV and DVD releases. When they'd wrapped on Bakano and the team moved on to working on Dura Kiyotaka Ohata joined them as a storyboard artist all over again. And guess who turned up in one of the episodes he worked on? It's not just that Bakano is a unique story, but it's a unique setting for anime as well. Prohibition era United States. The only other series I can think of like that is 91 Days, which was also produced by Yumi Sato. For Bakano, the team took a big trip together to New York City with the goal of reproducing it and its vibe in animation. This involved going to plenty of heritage sites and buildings that would have been around at the time, and they eventually drove down to Pennsylvania to visit the Steamtown National Historic Site, where they formed the idea for what the flying pussyfoot would look like. It was only a five day trip, but they got a lot out of it. Over a thousand photos to be specific. Background director Akira Ito wanted to include a ton of details and authentic items within each scene that would make the setting feel realistic. But in doing so, he absolutely went overboard. Both he and the director are perfectionists. And when you put two of them together, you get two things. Plenty of arguments, but also an incredible final product. And Bakano is incredible in every way. A great story, an adaptation that even the author regards as being superior, beautiful authentic backgrounds, and also, just to show off, yeah, the animation is brilliant as well. Early on, Amori managed to get the famed action animator Norio Matsumoto to animate for the show, and in doing so, encouraged a bunch of other star animators to join up who just wanted to work on whatever Matsumoto was doing. It also helped that the character designer and chief animation director Takahiro Kishida got on really well with Takahiro Amori. <laughs> In the end, it's a series worth being proud of. Omori considers it his best work. Akira Ito uses a background he drew for Bakano as the front page for his company website. And the Aniplex producer Shuko Yokoyama said that she believes it would become a show that people enjoy even 10 years after its debut. In retrospect, that was a low ball. Bakano was a masterpiece back in 2007 and continues to be a masterpiece today in 2022. Yokoyama went on to recommend that people watch the show all in one go, and Amori recommends re-watching it, and I agree on both counts. Bakano is a fun show to marathon. You spend much less time trying to remember who's who, and more time just getting absorbed in its energy. After rapping on Bakano, the team went their separate ways. Some stuck around to help Amori on his mega hit Natsumi's Book of Friends, others had different work lined up. But when the time came for production to start on Dura Rara and adapt 
adaptation of Ryogo Narita's other ensemble series, they reassembled. <laughs> I've never been able to call a favourite between these two shows. Both are masterpieces, and they do have a lot of similarities. An ensemble cast, fragmented stories, silly character names, brilliant voice actors, intriguing urban fantasy. One of the key similarities is in how they portray morality. In both series, the nicest characters are strange and unconventional. A duo of eccentric immortal thieves, a Dullahan with a transforming shadowy horse and scythe. Yet when it comes to the villains, the pinnacle of all evil, their backgrounds are relatively ordinary. Despite the supernatural themes of their series, both Lad Russo and Desire Orohara are twisted, yet very normal human beings. Bakano was an unconventional adaptation, and so they aimed to make Dura more straightforward in comparison. But that's the key term. Quote, in comparison. Sure, it's only heading to one conclusion instead of three at a time, but it's still based on a real Gonarita story, and once again, he gave them a lot of freedom. The original light novels are separated into chapters that each tell a particular story about internet culture, isolation, and information, while giving some clues as to how they might tie in with each other. A lot of them also serve as character studies, with plenty of prose that digs into how these characters think. The anime doesn't adapts these directly, but instead adapts them in spirit. The appeal of the light novel is in its deep characters and interconnected stories, so the appeal of the anime would be the same, but now it's done cinematically. Each chapter of the book is separate, but the first episode of the anime merges a bunch, using the camera to navigate between them. Ryugamine and Kira walk past Ryo Kamichika, and the camera decides, actually, I'll follow her instead. The introduction of Ryo so early on is significant. She's a minor character in Volume 6, released just a year before the anime debut, being used in the first episode, just like with Carolyn Gustav in Bakano. Once again, her role is original. In the light novels, Isaiah's is introduced along with this character, who was instead introduced in the second season, and in the books, Stelty is here to rescue this guy, not Ryo. But that's why they wrote this original subplot. They realised that they could use Ryo as a cinematic connection between Isaiah, Stelty, and Ryugamine early on. But what's particularly special is that each episode only ever tells you part of a story. The characters you follow aren't reliable narrators. The chat room starts out being entirely anonymous and even then, quote, Kanra's there trying to spread misinformation. Like Bakano, it's challenging you to put things together yourself and it's constantly revisiting the same events but from different perspectives. Durara is filmed with a bunch of eccentric characters, but you wouldn't call just one of them the main character. In fact, that role goes to the city. For the light novels, Ryogo narrator argues that Selty is the protagonist, but in Takehiro Omori's ensemble approach, it's the city that leads the action and brings people together. If you go to the actual city of Ikebukuro, the facade drops somewhat. It isn't this magical place of chance encounters and supernatural wonders. It's actually a relatively small part of Tokyo that's worth visiting for its Pokemon Center, rooftop aquarium, and its many owl statues. Both Bakano and Dorora are very character-centric, but if I were to oversimplify it, Bakano revolves around its events, while Durarara revolves around its setting. The idea of leaving Ikebukuro is absurd to some characters, none more so than Ryugamina himself. So when the series isn't moving the plot along, it's doing two other important things, establishing what these characters desire, and showing how Ikebukuro offers that to them. Of course, it's absurd and supernatural and ridiculous, but those have weight because the setting feels so real realistic. In comparison to a plane trip across the world for Bakano, location scouting was much easier this time around. It's only a 30 minute ride on the train from Brain's base. One connection. Background director Akira Ito already managed to recreate 1930s New York after just a few days there, but he managed to go even further for Durarara, capturing the feel of the city at every time of day. It is surprisingly accurate, almost obsessively so. After re-watching season 1, I took a walk around and it felt uncanny. You walk down the street, stop for a moment and go, wait, isn't this the dollars meetup? 
They made the now vacant Tokyo hands that Selty rides down much taller, but everything else is pretty much spot on. I'm a big fan of the look of Durara in general. Suzuhito Yasuda's light novel designs back in 2004 weren't great, but it didn't take long for him to establish a simple yet striking style. Today, he's one of my favorite character designers, and his work on those novels has transferred seamlessly into animation. Takahiro Kishida returned yet again to redesign the cast, but this time, star Bakuno animator Tatsuo Yamada came on board as well to serve as Durara's dedicated action director. He's an expert when it comes to dynamic, full-body physical action, and it's one of the reasons Shizawa ends up being one of the most fun characters to watch. And it's not just that the show looks good, but rather that we love the characters because they look good. When I first watched the show, Izaya became my favourite anime character. Of course, a large part of that is Hiroshi Kamiya's performance, but another is his expressions, poses and how he fights that constantly make him feel despicable as he chews the hell out of the scenery. Today, my favourite character is Selty. She's a character without a face, so the animators had to express her emotions entirely through body language. It's easier said than done of course, because they still have to play up the idea that she's this shadowy superhero. In fact, The Dark Knight released during production, and so the staff were basically obsessed with the idea that Selty was Batman, while Isaiah was the Joker. But unlike Batman, Selty has powers, and they're kind of simple on paper. They're just dark streaks, described in the book as inky black trails. But it's because of this simplicity that the animators have had the freedom to do what they like with it. It can take on any shape. So, let it take on any shape. <laughs> Bakano found cult success, but Durarara was actually popular. The DVD sold well, the merch sold well, the Shizai Dojinshi sold well. It genuinely had an impact, and while they hadn't initially planned on it, they eventually made a sequel five years later in 2015. However, the team weren't at Brainspace anymore. In fact, Yumi Sato had gone on to found her own studio, known as Shuka. Aniplex's relationship wasn't with Brainspace, it was with her individually. Aniplex producer Shuko Yokoyama and Yumi Sato were both new to their roles on the 2005 series Kamichu, and they continued to work side by side through Bakano, Natsume's Book of Friends, My Little Monster, Durarara, becoming fast friends and even going on holiday together. So when Sato left to create Shuka, Shuko Yokoyama made sure that her studio would keep getting contracts, starting with Durarara's second season. In fact, after they left, Brainspace never got an Aniplex contracts again. Durarara Season 2 is split into three cores, Shaw, Ten and Ketsu. It's a reference to Kishot and Ketsu, the Japanese four-act story structure, with the first season retroactively becoming the key or beginning, Shaw being where the story ramps up, Ten being the twist, and Ketsu being the finale. It doesn't fit exactly since I think every arc in itself is a Kishot and Ketsu, as are some individual episodes, but with Durarara's multimedia expansion, it's a fun nod to the series' literary beginnings. After five years, you'd expect more of the team to have gone their separate ways, but even following a studio move, the core team returned for 36 more episodes and two OVAs. And thus, its return felt seamless, as if it had never been gone. The only clue is that suddenly, within the space of a week, everyone started using smartphones. In talking about Durarara as a masterpiece though, I tend not to include these sequels. Ultimately, while I like Shaw, Ten and Ketsu overload on characters and subplots, which ends up distracting from the main appeal. Ryugimine's descent could have been interesting, but because each episode was filled with the Yakuza, the multiple Psychas, Isaiah's gang of misfits, things ended up feeling messy and unsatisfying. <sighs> At the same time, the production also faltered. They took breaks between the cores, and there were some standout moments, but especially when you get into Ketsu, you can't ignore the cracks. 
Today, this team has gone their separate ways. Takehiro Omori does return to lead the Natsume's Book of Friends sequels at Studio Shuka, but there's yet to be something that brings the whole band back together. For me, it has to be another Ryogo narrator adaptation. He's a brilliant writer, and this creative team understands not just the appeal of his storytelling, but also how that appeal can make for incredible television. Ensemble storytelling in anime is hard to get right, but they've already succeeded twice. And so, just putting it out there, how about a fate strange fake anime by Takehiro Mori at Studio Shuka with the Honbaku no Durarara team? A new urban environment, a cast of eccentric characters, stories that intertwine and interconnect in exciting ways. It just fits. There probably will be an anime adaptation when the novels are finished, but when they do make it, I hope they remember that the perfect team is already there. It's been 15 years since Bakano, 12 years since Durarara. I've been desperate for more Vyogo narrator stories in animation. I even watched a few episodes of that tabletop RPG adaptation Chaos Dragon just because a character narrator wronged was in it. But even if we never get to see that creative team adapt narrator's work again, Bakano and Durarara are still fun to revisit. I've loved re-watching both of these anime, and they've given me even more appreciation for the art of adaptation. Fans often obsess over the differences, treating anime like a spot the difference puzzle on the back of a Happy Meal. But there is more than one way to tell a story. If the author supports it, and the remix or changes make for a stronger story, then that's always going to be worth celebrating. Thanks for watching the Canopy Effect. While Durarara is available to watch on Funimation in the US and presumably will get moved over to Crunchyroll soon, their license for Bakano expired in 2016 and was just never renewed. It is neat to live in a world where we have so much access to media, but it's also a reminder that if something isn't new and hip, it can end up being treated as if it were disposable. And Bakano is anything but. Before I go, I'd like to thank these incredible people for supporting the channel. In particular, I'd like to thank Alan Baccaro, Austin Hardwick, Biopower, Chris Boylan, Dedemeet, Eddie Lehecker, Faux Wizard, Frizzy Canadian, Frog Kun, Fujay, Jacob Bosley, JR Pictures, Mike Tamborelli, My Own Mother, Rylan Taylor, Toma Roman, and Tiago Nesimentu. If you want more videos like this, then please visit patreon.com slash thecanoperefects.